Good morning, everybody. I'm Francesco Colizzi from IRB Barcelona, the Rotsko Lab, working in the Rotsko Lab. Um, <clears throat> today we will see in this uh, short talk how all, how all that you have learned so far and what you will learn tomorrow on free energy calculation can be combined uh, to face a uh, scientific problem of different kind. Although I'm the one presenting now, this work has been mostly done by Yvonne Westermeyer and Adam Hospital. Right, so there are three keywords in the title, AGFR, Alchemical Transformation and Building Block, and we'll see what they mean. Hopefully you know already a little bit what they mean. AGFR is a, the epidermal growth factor, it's a receptor, it's a cellular receptor, and uh, misregulation of this receptor creates programming in the cell, and this problem in the cells may lead to cancer, mostly. There are drugs that have been developed to tackle this. They are mostly ATP competitive inhibitors that bind to the kinase domain of the epidermal growth factor receptor. But resistance can be easily developed during the development of cancer. So new drugs are always uh, needed to tackle new mutation, basically. The receptor is also overexpressed many times. 60% of patients with metastatic no small cell longer have it overexpressed. And mutation may cause loss of therapeutic efficacy. So that's why it's critical to understand and to be able to predict whether or not the mutation, for instance, a new mutation, will create resistance or not. So we have collected a little bit of uh, experimental data that are shown here in the table with binding affinity. And uh, there are mutations that are a little bit spread everywhere around the active site, but also far away from the active site, and we will see how this can affect or can be problematic sometimes for the simulation that we will discuss here today. So a chemical transformation, how do we want to predict the effect, the effect of, a, of, a, of a mutation? We do it by calculating the free energy difference. Of the transformation from one amino acid into another, and we do this with a non physical path. They call it alchemical transformation. And in this alchemical transformation, we have uh, the Newtonian of one system. For instance, here we have a valine that is coupled with the shifting parameter lambda. And when lambda is zero, the system is, uh, resembles to a valine. When lambda is one, then the system is coupled with the serine. And what we can do is to shift the system from one side to the other. And we can do this in several times, in several ways. The approach that we will be looking at today here, it's an, an equilibrium approach, for, which means that we are doing this transition, this transformation very fast, in the range of 50 picoseconds or uh, 100 picoseconds. And we do this exploiting Gromax uh, thermodynamic integration feature and PMX, PMX to generate the topologies and also to analyze the data afterwards. Here in the slide on the left, you have a, a little plot of what we are doing. The system goes from A to state B with couplet to lambda, it goes from zero to one. We pull it basically from one side to the other and then we pull it back. Then there is a lot of me statistical mechanics that have been developed, starting from the uh, Jarczynski equation and also the Crookes fluctuation theorem for the bidirectional approach. And basically, that help us to uh, discount all the dissipated work because we are out of equilibrium and to recover the free energy difference of the process that we are simulating. Graphically speaking, this equation can be interpreted like the delta G shown in this equation is basically the intersection between the two Gaussian distribution of the work for the forward and reverse transition. 
you will see a lot of this probably tomorrow in the free energy calculation lessons. All right, so then what we will be doing, we are using several tools, different tools, and we want to combine them in an efficient way. And we, what we are doing this uh, by combining building blocks, putting these tools into a building blocks, and then assembling building blocks in the way we would like the most. This is very useful because then we can as give these uh, building blocks to a workflow manager that can parallelize, for instance, on a supercomputer. So building blocks makes everything more easily. You can take the feature from different tools and put them together. We have seen this already. Adam explained it very well. And one interesting feature also of building blocks is that they can combine it with workflow manager, such as PyComs, and then scale it uh, on a, a run on a supercomputer. For instance, here we're using Mare Nostrum to do this uh, kind of calculation. So you can get a terrific parallelization of this uh, simulation. Also, I would like to add that a chemical transformation, because we are doing this uh, each realization independently from the others, this has a, an intrinsic added value because it's intrinsically parallel. Like there, it, you, you can run a lot of simulation at the same time and then gather together the results. So the scalability is very high. So all these, once you put everything together, workflows, building blocks, knowledge of what you're doing, then you can apply everything to real science problem. So let's go back to our real science problem, real case scenario. We want to predict the resistance of a mutation to a drug. So here we have on the left a GFR. The, drug, the, 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 the enzyme, the kinase domain, when we add the drug, the drug binds to the ATP sign, binding side with an anomaly affinity, and this gives inhibition, inhibition of, the, of the enzyme with positive therapeutic effects. But what happens if we have a mutation, a patient that de develop a mutation, we add the same drugs, and the question that we would like to answer, or we are we will for sure wondering is, whether or not the drug is still effective in treating the, the patient. And this is what we are going to do here now in the next step. How do we do that? By calculating the free energy difference with of the ligand or the drug for the enzyme and uh, of the drug for the mutated enzyme. How do we do that? We, we, we do it by building a, a thermodynamic cycle. Here, the vertical branches of this thermodynamic cycle are basically shows us the Happel wild type structure. And here, like if we have the drug, we can calculate the delta G of binding of the drug. And on the parallel side, here on the right, always on the vertical branches of this thermodynamic cycle. We have the mutation of our enzyme, we add the drug, and then we can calculate the delta G of adding the drug to the mutated enzyme. But the problem here is that adding a drug can be quite disruptive uh, alchemical transformation. So what we could do, and to have everything more under control, is to add as little as possible perturbation to our system. And this is achieved by exploiting the thermodynamic cycle and the using calculating the delta G1, for instance, to move from the apple wild type to the mutated enzyme, and then to move uh, to do the same transition, transformation with the OLO enzyme, with the drug bound to the active site, and calculating delta G4. And what this thermodynamic cycle tells us is that basically we can get the free energy difference in the delta delta G binding between the mutated and the wild type enzyme in this way. All right, some preliminary results. 
are still running simulation honestly on this and uh, I will not go into the details so we have assembled 23 clinical mutation we are testing three drug inhibitors this is the table of the results and overall what we are observing is that we are correctly classifying mutation with the 90% accuracy which is good and the 10% that we are missing are what we are mostly related to cases where the delta delta G of binding is small and is within the basically is within the root mean square error of our calculation that we have assessed it to be around 1k cal per mole which is also what other people doing this kind of calculation have observed so the future application what we are looking at is to use uh, the tools that we have in our hands, the workflow that we have assembled by combining together different building blocks to perform a systematic drug resistance profiling of uh, AGF4. So we will mutate all around the active site residues and we will uh, calculate, we could calculate uh, the the delta delta G of binding. In this way, we could see whether or not a mutation is affecting the binding of a known drug. And to do this, we may want to use a, a tenfold affinity loss threshold criterion. Basically, if the delta G of binding is larger than 1.36 kcal per mole, then we may estimate we may estimate that the mutation is generating a resistance. If delta delta G is lower than 1.36 kcal per mole, then we may assume that the binding is still effective, there is no tenfold loss of affinity, and the drug may still be effective, may still be effective in treating, in binding the, the enzyme, in treating the pathology. All right, well, when we do this, so this is why this, this kind of approaches may have a like terrific impact on, uh, on, on the clinical, even on the clinical treatment. Let's say that we have a new mutation, nobody knows what it's doing. You can ask your computational friend to do the simulation for you. And uh, basically in uh, less than 24 hours, you know whether or not the mutation is, uh, is likely to generate a resistance or or not. And this may guide clinicians basically in defining the therapeutic pathway. Of course, like with all the caches of the case, considering these are prediction, and also for the caveats that I will show you that are shown here, just at the bottom of this page. So this kind of study may also help in prioritizing candidate compounds for clinical trials, and ultimately help in expanding the domain of application of personalized medicine. The caveats are several and we should very well know them. So mutation can generate a conformational change and can alter the conformational equilibrium of your protein. For instance, in a kinase, there are two states at least, active and inactive states that are in equilibrium and mutation may alter this equilibrium, shifting the population of the protein towards a conformation that we are not taking into account in our calculation. Also, because we are doing the simulation so fast out of equilibrium, there is likely uh, in, a, in a, a poor sampling of uh, ion redistribution it may also affect the calculation and uh, generate artifacts in the free energy calculation that we are doing and finally we are looking only or we are not looking only what we, we may tempt them we may be tempted to look only at the free energy of binding of the drug but for instance in this case of AGFR the mutation may also alter and modulate the affinity of ATP, which is the natural substrate of this enzyme. There are known mutations, such as the keeper one, that alters the affinity to ATP, 
and it is these that indirectly affect the or not the binding of drugs. So you need to be careful also with this. And also here the substrate affinity can be modulated, but this is like because the substrate is usually a protein, this becomes a little bit too complicated to model and we are not handling that for, for now, so far. But these caveats should be like kept in mind because like the number still seems to be correct, but there might be exception to this correctness. So wrapping up, what we have seen in this short talk is that like a bunch of computational tools, variety of computational tools, although we haven't gone into the details of them, but where user were combined together into a, in a workflow that was then scale scaled on a supercomputer to have a, a, a super efficient parallelization, basically. on thousands of core. You can run the simulation simultaneously on thousands of core and in a couple of hours get the, well, maybe, oh yeah, in a couple of hours get the results for one mutation, even less a couple of hours and, uh, and yeah, and do really impactful research because you can really give the answer in real time to the question that is that might be very critical, for instance, for a new mutation that appear in a patient. We have seen that the AGFR mutation have been correctly classified in about 90% of the cases. It was a promising. This is a good promising result. It put us in a position, an optimistic position, to look at the next step, the outlook, like systematic drug resistance profiling that may enable uh, real-time clinical and preclinical support, guiding basically clinicians into the, the most effective therapeutic path. We still need to be aware of the limit of this method and if we handle the limits then we can better understand how much farther we can push our prediction. So this is the end of this short talk. These are the people, the many people probably not all of them, I'm sure there are other people that are not listed here, but this is the main contributor to this project. And uh, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, let's see if we can have a question answer session, live session.